Now, stay tuned to Vinyl Community Podcasts. This is Concert Buddy. I'm back with my series on Vinyl Community Podcasts, Mind of the Record Collector, the series that asks what we collect, why we collect it, and how we find it. And I am joined today. I'm excited. I'm real excited. I'm joined <laughs> by one of the best in the community, in my opinion. One of the reasons I started my channel, True Story. Maybe we'll get into that. And this one, the only Melinda Murphy. Melinda, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I watch all of these videos. I've really enjoyed the series. I love seeing all of the people doing the interviews. So I'm honored to be here. And we would have had you on sooner, but I'm, I'm going to give you some flowers here because you had already lined up to talk to Rachel. And when we were kind of communicating, you're like, oh, I'm already committed to Rachel. I got to see that through. And I ton of respect for that so so we would have had you on way way sooner i don't want anybody to think that we completely whiffed on melinda but melinda was going down the pecking order and i can appreciate that right no it was it was my fault um i had told rachel long ago that if i ever got on and did an interview i'd give her the first one she's live so that was a little terrifying and it took me a while to decide to do it but i did do that several months ago so now i'm good so you know i wanted to honor my word well, and you got all, all the kinks, all the kinks in that one. So now you're just ready. It's going to be nice and polished for this one, right? Let's hope. <laughs> fingers and toes, fingers and toes. Well, if uh, if you're hearing this or if you're seeing this when we do the video companion piece, surely you know about Melinda's channel. Melinda has been doing YouTube about five years and she's approaching 30,000 subscribers. So tell us about that journey. Why did you how did you find the vinyl community and YouTube and decide to do it and just kind of take us on that walk? Well, it's so funny because um, I honestly just really started getting into vinyl collecting heavy in 2017, had no one to talk to about it. I just was so excited. You know how it is. You get kind of consumed with it and there was nobody to talk to. So I just, one day I thought, you know, I wonder if anybody like on YouTube shows the, uh, like vinyl records or anything. So I did a little search and, I had no idea there was a whole world on YouTube, but it was very different back then than it is now. It's, it was good then. It's great now. Uh, but you know, it was, it was really exciting. And so that's how I got started. I started seeing people showing their, you know, records, they were all friends with each other. And that really drew me in, you know, just the camaraderie that everybody had. So that's really what drew me into wanting to do vinyl videos. It took me a long time, a long time of watching people um, and admiring certain channels to finally get up the nerve to do them because I'm very backwards. I'd rather let someone else have attention. It's not necessarily my comfort zone. So to do this was just a huge desire to meet other vinyl collectors. So that's really why I started. Awesome. What were some of those channels that you saw? Because uh, Mazzy, for instance, like when I, when I talked to him, he, he made a really, really salient point about, I think you guys started about the same time and he kind of equated it to like, like high school in the sense of you like have a class of people you kind of start up about the same time. So for you, before you started your class, quotation marks, who are some of the channels you're watching? Well, I mean, Mazzy started before me, but I don't know how much I know. I, w- I was watching his videos before I started. Okay. Uh, uh, for me, um, and there are a lot of great channels out there, but for me, Billy Hurst is the GOAT. He is River uh, Riverbend Records now, but back then, before he had a store, he was a vinyl channel, and he had a combination of incredible records, records that'd be like, I didn't even know that was on vinyl, so that was really exciting. And then he just had this warm, great personality and I saw all the friend, you know, friends he was making in the vinyl community. So I loved watching him. Ron Beaudry, I learned so much from him too. And I was watching his videos. And Steve Carlson. Steve yeah, was a little bit ahead of me too. And I I love watching Steve. Uh, I don't always get to comment, but I do always watch. He's another one. I miss Billy Hurst just being Billy Hurst. Yes, yes. I respect that he's now Riverbend Records, and uh, I just wish I lived closer to where he is. I'd love to shop in his store more. Well, you, you do a nice job virtually because you, like me, always try to tune in Monday for those Facebook auctions that he has. He doesn't have them every week. You got to be 
You got a cheap plug, Billy. I'm going to give you a cheap plug here. You got to watch his Facebook to get notified, but I'll see you in the gallery sometimes. Yes. And so definitely can still support him that way for sure. Yes, I try my best when there's something I really want. I've been kind of lately, I haven't been buying as much. It seems like when I do buy something, it's been something a little on the bigger side and stereo equipment. But um, but yeah, I love watching his uh, I love watching his uh, auctions. They're fun. It feels like a group of friends just all sitting around together. I like that. You exactly. Know, so. And then yeah. Steve Carlton. I mean, yeah. if there's anybody nicer in the vinyl community, I haven't I met him. So. Melinda, you're right up there, Melinda. You're on the Mount yeah. Rushmore with yeah. Steve. But, I, I give the crown to Steve. He's the sweetest. He's just so nice. Uh, yeah. So I love watching him and Ron Baudry. Those are the ones that I can remember. There's so many more that are no longer doing videos, uh, you know, or at least just popping up every once in a while. But um, those are three that um, I was watching heavily back in the day. For sure. And there's, you know, a lot of trepidation kind of moving to the other side of the, the, the camera and kind of doing this ourselves. I would think more so and tell me if I'm wrong about because stereotypically it's usually like older white dudes. So for you to, 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 to be a lady and to, to kind of do this on your own, because there wasn't, I, I don't even know if there was any like other female led community channels around that time when you started, was that, did that add any kind of like thought in your mind of like, there's no one like me, quote unquote, uh, out here doing this? Well, thankfully no, because uh, we already had Omaha introvert. Uh, Hannah. And Ruby Lisa, I kind of remember her being around too, but Omaha Introvert, you know, she was already around making videos, but there weren't a lot of them. It was, those are the only two I can even think of. So, uh, but you know what? It just really never, I never felt like I was going to be picked on or mistreated. And I haven't been, I mean, I, maybe people say things behind my back. But uh, I feel like I've been treated very fairly and um, very welcomed. I was very welcomed from day one. For sure. And did you make a, a concerted effort? Because one of the hallmarks of your channel, even as many subscribers you have now, is you reply to every comment. And especially as your your channel is scaled, like that's got to be a job in and of itself. Because you don't just like reply back with like a heart or reply back to every other one like Mazzy. Yes, Mazzy, I'm calling you out on this one. But you literally... <laughs> reply to every single one was that like I mean it's got to be intentional right um yeah it is it is I feel like if someone takes the time to um comment to me and they're kind and it's a polite comment yeah I feel like I do at least want to say something acknowledge what they said sometimes it's an interesting question and honestly that's why I decided to make videos it wasn't so they could watch me it was because I wanted to have the conversation so that's really kind of what that came from for me. Um, so the comments are a conversation that I get to have. And there's so many people that watch every single video and I know them and they know me. Um, I may, I may go to a record store. I would never know their faces, but we talk every week. And so um, that's really the reward for me. That's really why I'm here is just to have the vinyl friends. That's really what I, I joined for. That's awesome. It's funny you said that because I was at a, a record show last weekend and I'd been talking to a guy named Brian online who like, you know, likes the channel, we exchange, et cetera. And I would always said, Hey, if I run into you at one of these shows, introduce yourself. Right. So I'm literally, I was talking to somebody to my left and I'm digging and, and, and this guy was on my right and he just stared, he kept staring at me, you know, like, you know, when somebody is looking at you. Yeah. And so I kind of looked over and, and I looked at him and I'm like, I knew I knew who he was, but I didn't know his name. And he goes, I'm Brian. I'm like, oh, yes. Like that is. And, and to your point, that's like so fun. When you actually in person or like when you actually can exchange. Like I know you drove talking about Billy. I mean, I know you went to River Bend Records and actually got to meet him. I know yeah. I think he stayed at your house through spring training. So you guys have actually created a real friendship, real air quotes, friendship. Yes, out of it. yes he's been to my house. We've record shopped together in what little kind of record store I actually have in my town. He went with me, but yeah, I, I have, I don't see a lot of the people. Like when I go out people, I don't get a lot of people say, Hey, I know you from your channel, but every once in a while, every once in a while, someone will say, Hey, I think I know who you are. And it's really cool to, you know, to, to do that. And, and it's funny because these thumbnails are so funny The people, when they leave comments, that might be like their cat. So they might say their name and I'll think, oh, it's a cat, you know, because <laughs> I don't know what they look like, you know. For sure. Yeah, that's funny. Um, so back into the community piece of YouTube, 
how do you feel? Because obviously the hobby has taken a lot of twists and turns in the last couple of years for the better. Some might say for the worse in other areas, but where, where, where do you kind of land on that? Because we are kind of in a, uh, a euphoric state, not even euphoric, a, a utopian state of reissues. Like there's so much, it's like, there's so much to consume. And I think a lot of that's driven by a lot of the feedback that comes out of the community and so forth. So what do you, how do you feel like the, the YouTube vinyl community affects the hobby today? Uh, I would say that if you are someone who likes to shop for originals, I'm, I like it all. I like it all. But if you're someone looking for originals, it's a tough time to be a vinyl collector because all the originals are really expensive. If they're even available, finding a clean copy is hard. If you're into the reissues, now is your time though, you know, and, and I like both. I like the new ones that uh, are, you know, Kevin Gray or Mobile Fidelities. I like all those records, but then, you know, when I'm looking for an original, it's a lot harder now than it used to be. So it's a mix, you know, I like it and, and I'm glad that more people are getting into it and hopefully the hobby survives for a very long time. But, um, but at the same time, it's just, uh, you know, what used to be a $10 record is now a $30 record. And the people just getting started are going to have a hard time finding those originals and they're not going to be able to go in. I mean, it used to be so much fun to just go into a store and find when you're first collecting it, when you buy 10 or 15 records and they were all under $10. Yes. And that's just not the case anymore. So it's, it's tough. It's a mixed bag, but um, it was great then. And there's things to be excited about now. So, you know, no, you're exactly right. especially if you're into jazz, now is the time to collect jazz records, unless you are into originals. Then again, you <laughs> run into that same problem. But uh, as far as reissues, they sound great. Most of them are affordable and you can build a great collection. Um, if you're a jazz person, so. Now, how long have you been collecting records? Like, let's kind of get into that piece before I ask you my next question. Like, has this been a lifelong thing or is it something that uh, you only started in the last five, 10 years? Like, tell us about it. Okay, so um, I started really getting into collecting in 2017, but I have to back up and just say, I have always been very fond of vinyl records. They, when I was a kid, I used to just hold myself up in the living room and play my mom's records, play what few records I had. I would just kind of be by myself and hold the vinyl records, hold the artwork, you know, listen to the music. And it, it had a sentimental, nostalgic hold on me. And then uh, I start, my daughter started collecting vinyl just in 2013 with a boyfriend she had at the time. They broke up. But uh, they were looking through vinyl records and I went to an antique store with her and I went in there and they had three for five dollars. All these records. Oh, my goodness. If I could go back in time and pick up some of those. they had Buckingham Knicks. They had I, oh. and I remember seeing Buckingham Knicks because I'd never seen it before. And I'm like, I didn't know Stevie Nicks and, and Lindsay Buckingham had, had their own record together. But I passed it up because I wasn't into vinyl yet. But I remember seeing all these titles. It was just like seeing all these old friends again. And I even picked up a few, even though I didn't have a turntable because they were three for five dollars. Um, so that was 2013, but didn't have a, a reliable turntable until 2017, uh, 2017 on Valentine's Day. My husband surprised me and he bought um, a really nice Denon turntable, uh, an Ortofon red cartridge. Uh, and some records. And we just took, looked around the house and pulled together some stereo equipment, nothing fancy, very, very, you know, not nice at all, but good enough. And after I had a reliable turntable, I went absolutely crazy. My husband and I, every weekend for years, would go out of town. We even went to St. Louis and spent a weekend. It was before Riverbend Records was there, but we went to Euclid and to all of these other record stores. And I just bought a ton and a ton of records. So uh, 2017 uh, is when it really clicked in for me. Do you feel like a part of that, because I'm speaking for myself, so tell me if you agree with this, is making up for lost time, especially like when you like what you're talking about before, the different stages of collecting, like they used to be so cheap. And then you think about the ones that you didn't get. So then when you find them again, you're like, jump in my basket, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I ended up uh, where I could have got that Buckingham Knicks record for 
uh, three for five dollars. I I finally bought a copy for fourteen dollars on that trip to St. Louis. I have since upgraded that copy and gave that copy nice. away. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, this I would see these records and I would like I remember having a cassette or I remember my friend. We'd be outside laying out in the sun back when you could sunbathe and not worry about cancer. We would have these cassettes and I just remembered all this great music and I'd see it. And I'm like, Oh yes, I have to have that. I have to have this and that. And back then, even in 2017, it was still somewhat affordable. It wasn't as cheap as it was in 2013, but it was affordable. So. And, and who, and back then, and even before then, because you've talked about this on your channel about your, your mother and so forth. How or who or why? How how kind of shaped your your taste in music? Was it purely experiential, or was there were there influences like family members, older siblings? How does that work? Um, it was really just what was playing on the radio. I hate to say that, but um, it was. I was my mom was a single mom. We didn't have a lot of money, so we did listen to the radio. So it was those seventies um, hits that were played. She had the radio on all the time. So it was all those great hits that were played on the radio. She listened to AM radio. So I love those seventies, mellow old hits, uh, that kind of stuff. And then I guess, as I started dating, I started dating guys that were kind of not edgy, but they liked edgy music. Like I guess think Motley Crue and rat and Winger. Uh, and <laughs> Winger, um, a lot of, uh, great music like that. And of course I fell in love with Van Halen along the way myself. Sure. And I'm glad I discovered Van Halen for myself, but um, a lot of it, I guess was people I dated friends I hung out with. It was what cassettes they owned and would put in when we were driving around the car, like guns and roses, we would drive around everywhere to appetite for destruction. You know, that was such a big deal back in the day. So, so really it was just my friends and, and I loved what my mom loved because it brings me back memories of my mom so of course yeah that makes sense same here like my mom single mom a lot of the same parallels like big influence i remember riding in the car she'd be playing some melissa etheridge you know what i mean and she would and, or the car self-titled would yep. wear those tapes out right but yeah now I do, I do have to ask a question you brought up guns and roses and it, you most certainly don't have to tell me how old you are but i'm picturing you rocking out did you have the big poofy hair, Melinda? Can you confirm I had the, the biggest gun? poofy hair. I'm 5'6", but when my hair was fixed back then, I was 5'8". <laughs> I measured myself. I go, you know, yes, oh, yeah. I was definitely a big hair. Aquanet for days, yeah. yeah. Yes, um, my hairspray was finesse uh, pump spray. I didn't use Aquanet, but yes, I remember okay. Aquanet very well. <laughs> oh, what yes. a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> for sure. I no, I remember days. it. Life was yeah, simpler well, then. <laughs> it was a lot simpler. I mean, I do remember, and I'm kind of dating myself. I was in fourth grade when Appetite came out. And in elementary school, it was all the rage. And I remember having my biker shorts. I mean, it's it's, just, it's interesting how music can really make you think back, and you can almost transport yourself back to a time when you're thinking about those memories. Yeah, I was a senior in high school when Guns N' Roses' Appetite came out. So you can maybe do the math and figure it out. Beep, bop, boo, bop, boo. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Older than you. <laughs> Definitely. You're scoring at home. You can do the homework, right? Um, <laughs> one last thing on the YouTube uh, piece, um, you know, as somebody, there's been a lot of people who have started channels, especially through COVID, right? Um, and I think a lot of people, at least people I've talked to, heard newer air quotes in the community, like myself. Like I was watching, I was just like you yeah, watched for a long time. I, I was even a never commenter. I just right, didn't comment. Just really. watch. And and then you know, COVID. It was even a hyper focus because you're at home and. You know, people are really just buying records and all that kind of stuff. But newer channels, newer channels have started in the last couple of years. What kind of feedback would you give them or something you may have learned, maybe a, a learning or a, a misstep or what have you that you would be like, yo, you got to do. Here's one piece of advice. Definitely take it. Just to be patient that you're not, you know, most of us are not overnight successes. It took me a long time to get to a thousand subscribers. It it took a good part of a year. It, you know, sometimes it even takes longer. I just got lucky and had a, a one video that did well and kind of snowballed and it went a little faster for me. I, I just say, please just try to have fun with it. My best advice is watch other people's channels, comment, let them know you have a channel. Cause that's one thing you can comment on my channel, but if you don't tell me you have a video channel, I won't know. 
Usually, if you tell me you do, I will look you up and I will at least subscribe and try to check out a video when I can. I say just put yourself out there, watch other people, support them, and usually they will turn around and support you too. It, it's kind of like that. I know it's a bigger world now. There's more people making videos. Um, it used to be a lot smaller than it is now, but uh, I say just reach out make as many friends as you can. That's my best advice. For sure. No, a hundred percent. I think, uh, like you, you touched on earlier, Melinda, the actual touch points and, and the relationship building is something I was looking for. I was, I was asked my wife, I was dragging her to record stores and, and all these places on the weekends, kind of like Papa Murphy, like you're talking about earlier. Um, and then I'd want to talk to somebody about some of this stuff. I'd be online and I'd be reading whatever. And so the greatest gift, honestly, of this is, these people we've met and the relationships and yeah, the music's great and collecting is fun. No doubt. Mm -hmm. It is the people. It starts with the people. It ends with the people and it's how you treat the people. Right. And you do a great job of that for sure. Thank you. Yeah. I, I will say one of the biggest thrills I had early on was, um, you know, with Billy uh, Hurst, he was, he was just someone that if I knew uh, I got a notification that he had a new video up, I'd be really excited. Couldn't wait to come home from work so I could watch his video. And he did a vinyl tag one time and um, I had mentioned that I was loved his channel and uh, in my vinyl tag. And then when he made his vinyl tag at the very end of the video, he brought up my name and I'm like, oh, he knows who I am. Oh, my gosh. It was just so exciting. So just reaching out, give shout outs to people you admire and hopefully they see it. Um, I know it's it's harder because it's a bigger vinyl world now. But, um, yeah, just. Be nice and reach out to people if there's contests. Do people still do a lot of contests nowadays? It used to be everybody did contests all the time. Um, Enter contests yeah. when you're first starting out. That's a great way to get to know people. For sure. Well, you're leading me into a great segue, Melinda. So I got to thank you. I'm going to call you the co-producer of this episode because the next <laughs> thing I was going to talk about is you know as your channel is getting larger and and, and your reach and and your audience is is growing in numbers. Do you feel, and that's kind of why I asked about like feedback for new channels. Do you feel like a like a sense of obligation is or isn't uh, the, the right word, but more of like a duty or like a you know just kind of like paying it forward to give a give a rub? Like you've done this for me and for my channel, and I appreciate it. Just kind of a mention in a video goes such a long way. Exactly what you're talking about is that something like consciously like you're you do try to make sure to give somebody a little bit, a little rub or a little love here and there to kind of like let them know you're watching? Uh, yes. If I do, if there's a, an opportunity and it fits into a video that I can give somebody a shout out, I like to do that. I really like also giving shout outs to record stores uh, when I can. The people who have record stores, I like giving them shout outs too. But yeah, if if there's somebody that I've really enjoyed, yeah, I would because I want them to continue on and I want them to be successful. So I do. I it's it's tough because I don't always have time to discover new channels. That's hard. Sure. You get your own that you've been watching for years, and your time is so limited. But yes, if I run across someone and I, I really want to help them out, I, I don't know. I don't know how much it truly helps. I think getting a name out there is always helpful. So, but yeah, I. I don't know if I feel a sense of duty about it, but I definitely like to help people in the way that I was helped early on. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. S similar, similar kind of question coming up here too about, you know, again, as your channel is getting bigger, um, companies reach out to you. I'm going through this kind of now myself. They reach out to you with opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of you feels like, Hey, I really am a sense of gratitude for even considering me, yeah. but Surely there's been some things that have come across your way that you just kind of shook your head. How do you politely remember that your audience is always going to be watching and, and kind of, I would say deny, but turn down certain opportunities and choose other opportunities to talk about from uh, a record label may send you some records you want to talk about them or like mobile fidelity. You've talked about them on your channel. Like how do you, how do you kind of plan out making sure that you're using your platform in a positive way of influence? Uh, I think, I just have to like the product really well and it has to work for me, something that brings me joy or something that helps me out. Um, there is a, like a cleaning product, product groove washer. I have turned, I've, I've turned down other opportunities, but this groove washer 
I, I really like their product. I feel like it makes a big difference with my records. Uh, so I have talked about them on my channel. I've turned down some things that I don't feel um, like. I think that, yeah, I've turned down some things that I feel like don't aren't a good fit for me. But then there's other things. I guess the bottom line is I just have to like it. I have to mm -hmm. believe in it uh, and use it myself or I won't, you know. But yeah, I've had some opportunities that I've turned down. Um, and that's what's weird is when I first started, I never once joined the vinyl community thinking I would even be monetized For sure. um, because none of us were. I didn't know of anybody when I first started that. I'm sure there was a few people monetized. Most people weren't. I wasn't even planning on monetizing. But then my husband said, you know, why don't you monetize? Because YouTube would be paying you and you're buying all these records. Why not have a little money from YouTube? They're going to make money off you. So sure. uh, I decided to do that. And then after a few years, uh, some other opportunities that were never, I never saw any opportunities five years ago. These record labels weren't reaching out to people like they are now. It's very different. So, um, you know, I never went into it with that intention. So it has to be something I really like. And uh, no one's really paying me. It really isn't a big money maker anyway to endorse a product. You might get a free record. You might get a little money. But um, and even YouTube monetizing, it doesn't pay a lot. It's not the retirement plan that people may think in their mind, like, this is it. I don't need to be a Walmart greeter in my 80s. I'm going to do YouTube and I'm set. No, it's not at all. I mean, if you break it down with how many hours I spend on coming up with videos, making videos, answering comments, it's way, way, way below the minimum wage even, you know, so yeah. you don't do it thinking you're going to make the big bucks unless you do something besides vinyl, do a different topic or subject that's more popular, you know, talk about Taylor Swift, then you <laughs> might actually make some money, you know? <laughs> it's funny you say that because I think it was Michael 45 pointed out a few months ago that like my community is pretty, it's, it's growing, but it's pretty fine. You're exactly right. That, that it, if that the goal of anyone starting a channel is to be famous or be rich or whatever, vinyl community videos, probably not that. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, as far as ch YouTube channels in the big ocean of YouTube, I'm not even an amoeba. I mean, right, you right. know, it's, it's a very small niche. So, but sure. you know that, and that's why I I didn't do it because I thought I was going to become a YouTube star, and I I really honestly wouldn't want to be. Um, I just wanted to make friends and and talk about records. And so, sure. yeah. well, well, let's talk about something maybe you didn't also not see back five years ago, and it's that you're you're the rabbit hole of what I'll call audio filedom that you've you've taken because obviously part of it's learning, part of it's understanding, you know. What does 180 gram mean? What does, you know, mastered from the analog tapes, all those kind of kind of buzzwords and so forth. So there's learning there. But tell us about as you've really kind of acclimated, because a lot of your channel, especially of late, like you, you've upgraded your system. You've kind of walked through the, the changes you've made to your own listening environment. Kind of take us through the walk of how, when, where that kind of started for you when you realized, yeah, I really want to put more kind of thought and, and purpose and intentionality into the system I'm listening to and, and learning about it. Uh, well, I mean, I'm trying to remember what first, what record exactly, but I would, I would definitely pinpoint a moment was I entered a contest uh, and the channel was Robert Z and I won. And he sent me a Bob Dylan. Um, I forget what record it's called. One of the mobile fidelity records, John Wesley okay. Hart is what it was a mono. And I'm like, okay, I, I didn't even have a Bob Dylan record before. I didn't even know if I liked Bob Dylan. I put the record on and I had very, very meager equipment, nothing special, nothing fancy at all. And yet the sound quality of that record was unbelievable. Again, playing that harmonica, it was like almost, I mean, it sounded like he was in the room and I was like, this is, you know, if I can have more of this. I want more of this. This sure, is, what, sure. you know, I just wanted something to bring me closer to the music. I want the music to sound as good as it possibly can. That turned me on to MoFi. That turned me on to what they call the audio file records, like analog productions, mobile fidelity, SAMS, uh, you know, intervention, all of the great uh, 
music labels. That's what turned me on to it is I just wanted to be closer to hearing that great sound on all of my records. And, and along the way, people who watch my channel would kindly say, you know, you're at a point now, Melinda, maybe spend a little less money on records and get a better turntable, upgrade this, upgrade that. And, and so I was able to do that. It's not cheap. Um, and I still have, like, I know people have much fancier equipment than I do, but um, I've invested in good stereo equipment. And so I, you know, I've been able to tell the difference, but it really, I don't even consider myself an audiophile. I just find stereo equipment fascinating, interesting. I love hearing the different stereo equipment and what it can do and the upgrades. And I love records that truly just bring me closer to the music. That's really what it's all about for me. I'm sure that makes sense. You know, one label I never hear you talk about, and, and maybe there's a reason or maybe there's not, is Vinyl Me Please. Do you ever do Vinyl Me Please records? Well, I've never um, I've never entered or joined Vinyl Me Play, Please, but I do have a friend, Mike from Nebraska. He doesn't make Not the Mike from Nebraska, yep. He's one of my friends, and I talked to him, and we're, I just, he's so sweet. He will, he's a member, and if there's something I want, he will get it for me. So I have that new, the Master of Reality Black Sabbath. Oh. Uh, he picked it up for me. I pay him back. I'm going to get the Dolly Parton. I guess it's back in stock, or it was. He's going to order um, oh, Jolene for me. Mm -hmm. And what other ones do I have? I know I have Blonde on Blonde, and it was a, a VCLT from Marican. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It to me as a, I won a contest or something and she sent it to me. So I do have some vinyl me, please. And I, I love, uh, they usually sound really good. I like the color vinyl. It's cool. You know, anytime you get something that sounds great is on a cool vinyl and has a beautiful album cover. It's a, it's a winner for me. I mean, so I like vinyl me, please. I just have never joined the club. They haven't quite hooked me in completely yet. Yeah. They I agree. Really <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, no, I was like that too. I'd always do like the three months and three months and I'd kind of come in and out. So I can definitely appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, one question I have for you is, you know, nowadays, I think there's, and then tell me if you agree or disagree that there's different kind of stages. I wouldn't say levels, but stages of collecting, at least as a journey, like we were talking about before when records are so cheap, it's collection building, right? You're just amassing right. all these things. Uh, and then it comes to upgrades, right? You want to get a better copy or you want to get a better sounding copy. So there's, there's changes in what you may already have. Where do you kind of find yourself now? And the reason I ask is, you know, like you were talking about finding originals is getting harder and harder. I'm always curious, like where people are finding records now, obviously there's online and obviously you can go to sh shops and stuff, but like, where are you generally? Cause I think you've even talked about this on your channel, about like antique stores don't really have it as much as they used to. So like, where are you finding records these days, Melinda? Well, I don't get to go to as many record stores as I'd like. That's probably a good thing because I always spend a lot of money when I go. Uh, but there, here in Bowling Green, there are a few record stores. So when I do come visit my daughter, I will sometimes go to Mellow Mats, Melodies and Memories. And of course, Hard Copies. Is, there's a uh, one in the mall called Hard Copies. And I'm friends with Doug, the owner. He used to have a store where I lived. But unfortunately, he moved here and he's doing much better. He's more successful here and I'm happy for him. But so I will go to those stores. I will order online. I like ordering from the InGroove or Music Direct, uh, Analog Productions. Uh, you know, I that's where I buy a lot of my stuff that's coming in, like that 75th anniversary from um, oh Analog Productions, all those really yeah, great Atlanta. I've been buying some of those. I like uh, buying... Um, some of those mobile fidelity records. I do get a few promotional copies, but I do still buy a lot of the records too. I like, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at right now, but I, there's still a, some originals that um, just, I haven't been able to find that I hope uh, someday I will run into at a record fair or something like that. I just don't get to do stuff like that that often. It's, there's going to be a record fair from what I understand in the city that I live in. I don't, I haven't really found out that much information about it yet, but I think it's going to, there is going to be one. I hope it's a success and that they do that every year, but yeah, I mean, that's what I do. I just Riverbend records. I buy from the auctions, you know, when there's something I want. What about whatnot? Have you ever dipped your toes in the whatnot app and that kind of stuff? I've watched, but I've never bought anything from whatnot. It goes too fast for me. I don't know. It's just a little too <laughs> hectic. I'm afraid I'd get caught up and spend 
$500 on a record that I don't need. I don't know. Uh, I'm just a little, they make me nervous, I guess. They're too exciting, maybe, if you will, you know? Very Vegas-ish. I can appreciate that for yeah. sure. Is, can I ask, is one of the records the OGs are trying to chase down? You may already have it. Is it Blonde on Blonde? Do you have an original of that? I have an original of it. I already have that one. It's uh, the one I really want. That's an original is that Bob Seeger. I think it's called back in 72 yellow cover. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the page. I think that's the song that's on there. I want that one so bad. And I had it in my hands one time and it was like $70 and the condition just wasn't oh, that good. So yeah. I passed on it and I'm thinking maybe sh that should have been a placeholder, but it seemed a little high for it to be, Especially that was over three years ago. Mm. Seemed a little high for what the condition was, but it's the only time I've ever seen it. So it yeah. is, I was going to say, isn't it always the ones that got away that we always seem to remember? <laughs> Most well, yeah, that. it comes. It makes me feel like you're just not grateful because you've got all this really cool stuff and you're obsessing over the one you didn't get. You know, no, no for sure. No, there's times, and when I when I moved a couple months ago, I kind of was reminded of. of just what I had, you know, it's kind of funny is like you amass this collection and you know, some things you just don't get around to. And then I was like, Oh yeah, I do have velvet revolver for sure. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, okay. And, and sure discogs would tell me the same thing, but unearthing them. I think Chris Profi even did a video once about like digging in your own record collection, like literally shopping yourself. <laughs> to remind yourself. What's your price possession? I know you're the interviewer, but I want to know what your price possession is. Ooh. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, that's a good question. I've got a couple. Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I have several. Uh, Nirvana, Nevermind, First Pressing probably is on that yeah. Mount Rushmore. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and and you're talking about Mike Ingroove earlier. He's to blame for that one because he did that shootout. And when he said that was the best of the best, then I became obsessed with getting that copy. And it, But to your point, I was patient. And it wasn't cheap, I'll say that, but what it's going for now, I paid a fraction of. So I'm very happy and, and relieved with that. But I get caught up a lot of times in the stories too, like about the Universal Fire. So now I'm like obsessed with, like I just got a Counting Crows record that um, wasn't cheap, but they'll never repress it from the tapes because the tapes burned up. You know what I mean? Those oh, kind of boy. things, those, yeah. those kind of records and stories, th th those are where I kind of lean. I got like a first pressing of Maggot Brain, one of my favorites. So Ooh, yeah. it, it it's, it's kind of like like children, you know. You can't really say you have a favorite, but I've got several that are you know, like super fun, like my Rodriguez records, and all of them have a story too. And that's kind of what I enjoy about them the most is like I I literally keep them on my shelf, like all my let's call it top tier in yeah. just one cube. So if there's a fire, God forbid, that's the if I'm grabbing any records, which should not be a priority. If your home's burning, get the the, the animals and the people right. out. <laughs> But if I have 30 seconds to just grab one armful of records, it's that right. cube and it's got, you know, like my Matchbox 21st pressing. So, you know, every, everyone collects different things. But anyway, that's a word salad to say. I'd say Nirvana Nevermind first pressing is probably, and that's the one my son really wants the most. So not that he wants anything to happen to me, but that's the one he's always like, wow, I can't believe you have that. So that makes yeah. it a little bit cool. But what's really makes me sick about it is one of the first times when I was very first collecting vinyl, I was in Florida at a store and they had a first pressing for a hundred dollars and I didn't oh. buy it. <laughs> I didn't know any better. I thought, well, who's going to pay a hundred dollars for Nirvana? You know I mean, Oh my gosh. It's I had funny no idea. Story. I had no it, idea. Well, it used to be it, it, talking about the stages of collecting. I remember when a $50 record was like, Oh, no way. Right. There is no way. And then now right. it's just like, I mean, new, new releases. <laughs> I know you're fifty dollars now. Yeah, uh, that's funny. Well, this is this is a good transition point. Again, doing an excellent job of co-producing the show, Melinda. Um, <laughs> let's go into the lightning round. I like to ask these questions because they're just kind of fun. They're kind of light, um, and it's a good way to kind of round out the talk. So, first one I have for you: you can reunite one band for one night, one show, and this means you can resurrect them. I mean, no limitations. The imagination can run wild. Who is it, and where are they playing? All right. Well, I'm going to just say Van Halen and stop there because, of course, I would love to see Eddie. But, um, and I would love to see them at an old stadium in Evansville, Indiana. It was Robert Stadium. It's where I saw all the concerts there. It's now torn down. Let's bring it back. But I have a, a little bit of a better take on this. I would like to see, and this, the first part of this answer is going to be boring, but hear me out. I would like Fleetwood Mac 
to get back together because I've never seen them. And yeah, I know mm. there is still a possibility, but I want to take it a step further. I want to see them and I want to see them at Robert Stadium. But I want to see Lindsay and Stevie finally admit they're in love. They love each other and get <laughs> married. That's that's the goal. That's what I would love to see. If I okay. can and write the script and write the story, uh, Lindsay and Stevie, you know you love each other, even though you <laughs> think you hate each other. Get married, make us all happy. That's really that's my rock and roll dream right there. Get them together. I, I like it. <laughs> that's terrific. Um, well, kind of what you're asking me a little bit earlier, I'm going to turn it back mirror time on you and, and similar question. What is like the number one find you can think of in the wild that gave you the most joy? Now I call it the O S H I T moment, right? But we all have them cause you just kind of flipping and there's the usual suspects. And then all of a sudden, wow, here it is. It almost glows sometimes, right? Like what, what's the one above all else that you can think of having that feeling? Well, if, if people who know me, they know the story already, but I went into Louisville um, and I was in a record store and I was flipping through the Beatles records. And all of a sudden I ran into uh, the Yesterday and Today album. And you see those all the time. But this one, the owner had posted Beatles Butcher Paste Over, $30. Oh, come and on. Like, interview over, interview over, Linda. <laughs> and so I'm like, my eyes are bugged out of my head. And my husband, he's like looking around and he looks over at me and then he does a double take because he sees me going, oh, you know, and then he looks over. He goes, oh, yeah, I see. I know it's exactly. So I went and bought it before anybody else. I was so afraid someone else knew if they discovered what I'd seen. They would say, oh, that thing's worth a fortune. Don't sell it for thirty dollars. So I got it and bought it and walked out of there and. It was unbelievable. I just could not believe that. But I went back a week later and I asked the guy, I said, you sold me that yesterday and today record. And it was the Beatle Butcher. He said, yeah, did I, did I not charge enough for that? I said, you really didn't. And he said, you know what? I don't even care because he said, I hate looking up Beatles records and trying to figure out what pressing it is. He said, They're, it's crazy. There's a million of them. He said, I made a ton of money off of that collection that I got in. And if you got a good deal on it, I'm happy for you. So then I felt like, okay, because I almost felt bad taking it for $30, but he seemed to be fine with it. So um, yeah, that was the most exciting story. So you know? I don't know if you can hear that. Those are sirens outside of the home are the authorities for the robbery. <laughs> <that you committed. laughs> yes. Uh, that's awesome. No, but that, those are the kind of things. And those are the kind of stories that make it fun right that make like looking back not to say we'll ever get rid of our records who knows what the future holds but those are the things that along the journey are just fantastic mm -hmm. um you, you talked about earlier about you know as you're kind of starting your musical journey listening to music and radio and, and, and tapes and so forth how do you and radio is kind of like a weird thing now because it's terrestrial radio is obviously a lot different now than it was how do you learn about new music is it youtube is it recommendations I don't really listen or know a lot about new music unless it's really big, like Harry Styles. I like Harry Styles. <laughs> I loved his first album. That one's my favorite. You, you almost have to be really big before you get me to where I know who they are. I really am. That's a weakness of mine and I will admit it. And if I want to go see live shows and concerts in the future, I'm going to have to get to know some of those newer bands because Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks are not going to be around forever. And I do need to know better, you know, newer music. So I'm, I'm just really bad about not knowing new music. I'm I'll admit it. I don't. I don't I'm right there with that. you. I, I've turned in my parents in that sense. So I have to play this drop. Sorry. All right. Exactly. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> no, it, uh, it's funny. And the reason I asked the question is because I was thinking something similar because Last year when I was doing like my year-end videos, I, I was doing like my, my top 10 new releases I picked out. And I, I didn't even have 10, Melinda. I, I think I had like eight or nine. I felt like such a phony. And then it got me thinking, like, how am I learning? About it used to be I'd get the local paper and I'd see who was coming to town. And, you know, again, different time and place in life. But it's so much different. And you would think it'd be easier with Spotify and streaming and YouTube and all that. But I'm really bad about new music. So I'm glad I, I have mean, misery left. I'm in the wrong format to discover new music for the most part because vinyl records, I mean, they're True. mostly old bands and I'm discovering bands I didn't know existed back in the day 
um, you know, I know more about them. And I do have uh, people who do recommend music to me and I will listen to what they recommend on for my channel. So, but I'm really bad about that. New, You know, you did really good. If you could name eight new oh, bands yeah. or new releases. That's that tough. You, yeah. That's tough. Um, so kind of off of the music path for a second, um, I'm hoping you like movies. What kind of movies do you like? Do you like go to a particular genre, like a documentary or rom-com or something like that? Like what, what's kind of like your go-to when you're not watching YouTube vinyl community videos? Mama? I like thrillers, suspense movies. Those are my favorite. Uh, I like documentaries and they're, you know, about bands especially, but just documentaries about anything that interests me in general. I like documentaries best, but I do like a good mystery suspense kind of movie. That's kind of my thing, you know. Nice. Do you watch movies? Yes. More or less. No, no more or less since you started the YouTube journey, would you say? Um, it's probably about the same. My husband is big into movies and he collects movies and we have a really nice theater room in our house. It looks like a movie theater, the, the nice chairs. And awesome. so we will watch movies. Um, and I try to watch as many with him. And I sometimes have to give up watching a live stream or something that, you know, YouTube involved or vinyl related, uh, so that I can watch some things with him because he's kind enough to give up some of his time for my hobby. Um, and I do enjoy watching movies with him as well. So, um, yeah, I watch about a movie or, or two a week. Okay. Awesome. So, mm -hmm. All right. Last one. We've done it almost. So we're okay. almost across the finish line. You use Discogs, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. So top of your head doesn't have to be like to the number. How big is your Discogs want list at the time? Yeah, I did I did not, I don't know. I don't have a number, but um, it's not as big as someone might think, but everything I want is big. <laughs> like um, <laughs> uh, one of the things on my want list is um, the uh, Led Zeppelin that, that carry that big old case. Oh, you know? the, the travel yeah. case. Holy smokes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. You want to talk about a negative. I really regret. I went into a store one time and they had that Kisteria, the kiss box set and I didn't buy it. And it was back when it was, I don't know, $1,500 or something, which was yeah. a lot of money back then, but nothing compared to what it would go for now. But everything I want on Discogs is pretty much those expensive dream items. Uh, I will sometimes, I'm usually really good at seeing something that I never knew I wanted that all of a sudden I want when I'm digging through records. So I don't really put a lot on my wish list, so to speak. Okay. Just kind That's of find fair. them as I go. Awesome. Love it. Well, Melinda, we did it. We <laughs> came out on the other side and hopefully for the better. I want to thank you. First of all, great to meet you. Second of all, thank you for sitting down with us. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Melinda Murphy, YouTube channel. I'll have all the information in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time here on Mind of the Record Collector on Vinyl Community Podcast. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Ch uh, Chance. It's been a real honor to meet you. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, oh, honor. Are you kidding me? It's the other way around, but thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. And that was another trip around the turntable. Thanks for listening to Vinyl Community Podcasts.